Hello, welcome to Biz 113, Intro to Business. Today we're going to be talking about marketing, which at its core means serving the customer. So before we get into defining marketing or the rest of this PowerPoint, I just want to briefly say that it, this is going to cover a very surface representation of the marketing effort. Um, since this is an introduction to business class, what we're trying to do is get you familiar with each segment within a business. Marketing in and of itself, you can actually major in and take multiple classes because there is so much involved in the marketing process. So with that said, we shall commence. So what is marketing? Marketing is the activity, set of institutions and processes for creating, communicating, delivering, and exchanging offerings that have value for customers, clients, partners, and society at large. And that is the def definition that comes from the American Marketing Association, which they uh, defined or redefined in 2011. So most of us think of marketing as advertising and selling, but it's so much more than that. It's everything to do with customer relations. So marketing is a team effort involving literally everyone in the organization. So some of the specifics marketing includes product development, defining its features and benefits, setting its price, identifying the target market, making potential customers aware of it, getting people to buy it, distributing it to people who buy it, and managing relationships with customers after it has been delivered. So really from the minute that that item gets in, you know, comes up with an idea, someone comes up with the idea, the marketing department is involved. So it is usually a large department and there's usually lots of facets under that marketing umbrella. So the marketing concept is the process of satisfying customer needs while meeting organizational goals, such as making a profit on the product, which as we know is the ultimate goal of most for-profit businesses. So first we find out what the customer's needs, we develop products to meet those needs, we engage the whole company in efforts to satisfy the customers, and four, we achieve a profit. The marketing concept takes into account the balance between the commitments to cons customer satisfaction and company survival. So, you know, if you are focusing on customer support and you have tons and tons of people available to help your customers, that's going to cost a lot of money. So you have to balance that with how much money each of those customer service people are saving the company or ensuring the company is maintained. So, you know, we all have this need to satisfy our client, our customer. Sometimes it's too expensive to satisfy some customers and you are then faced with letting go of that customer. And frankly, some customers are a giant pain in the butt and you don't care if they leave unless they are a huge financial, um, Im financially important to the company. So a marketing strategy is a plan for performing two tasks. One, selecting a target market, and two, developing your marketing mix, implementing strategies for creating, pricing, promoting, and distributing products that satisfy customers. So you got to figure out who you're going to sell to and what your product is before you really start any of the marketing work. The target market process involves identifying a specific group of consumers who will be particularly interested in the product, who would have access to it, and who have the means to buy it. So for example, who is the target market for Lucky Charm cereal? Well, your average seven-year-old probably loves Lucky Charms doesn't matter if they're a boy or a girl, doesn't matter if they're in Kansas or um, Massachusetts, it's kind of a universal cereal that all kids love. Now, where do you market something like that? 
well you want to market it to kids so that's where the cartoons come in and things like that conversely who is the target market for minivans now you could say well kids are the all are always the ones who are in the minivans but they're not actually buying the minivan it's mom and dad um, so the minivans are going to be marketed specifically to families because the minivan has lots of room and it gives you videos to watch and all kinds of fun stuff that the parents want so that the kids won't fight and try and kill each other. Now additionally we're also looking at external marketing considerations and there are five sets of factors that impact the marketing strategy. Political and regulatory issues. So for example if suddenly we are in a situation where we don't want to do business with Saudi Arabia anymore then we're going to have to adjust our market so for example we sell a lot of weapons and guns bombs and stuff to Saudi Arabia if we get into a fight with them and we decide not to sell them anymore these weapons then the companies in the United States that sell these weapons are going to be adjusting their marketing considerations. Then we have the economic considerations. 2008, the housing market crashed. You couldn't sell a house. No one was buying because everyone had lost their jobs. And it was basically a generally terrible time in this country. However, you know, the economy bounced back. It is growing and has continued to grow and people are back in the world of spending money which is what happens when you go through an economic recession. People keep the money to themselves. They hide it under their mattress, they bury it in the backyard because they know, you know, we've all experienced um, the bank failures and the businesses that collapsed and the retirement funds that collapsed. Then you're also, number three, looking at competition. So if you are looking to bring a phone, a cell phone to market, you have two massive competitors. You have Apple and you have Samsung. And you have to ask yourself, can you compete with those companies? They have more money, they have more manpower, they have larger marketing systems. So, you know, that's the kind of issue that sometimes small companies face that they can't break into the market because the competition is so stiff. Then there's the technological aspects. Now, 10 years ago, the smartphone was just becoming a fact of life. It was very rare, was not that popular yet because companies hadn't started really figuring out what to do with it. Well, in the last eight years, we've seen a massive rise in things like apps, cell phones, cell phone carriers, cell phone protectors, cell phone outfits, cell phone, you name it, they can find something to do with it. So as the technology changes, so does the ancillary businesses that go along with that. So, for example, if you go 20 years ago, uh, clamshell cell phones had just started coming out and those are the ones that you open like a clamshell and suddenly everybody had these little pockets built into their bags and purses to put their clamshell cell phone in. And finally we have our social and cultural marketing considerations. Um, at this point in 2018 the uh, Me Too movement has been very prevalent so um, Anybody who sells things like uh, a t-shirt that says no fat chicks, which used to be very popular in the 80s, they're not going to get a lot of business these days because people who buy those shirts are going to get hissed at and will never get a girlfriend. So uh, we also look at the social and cultural issues and they oftentimes are hard to predict because until the movement actually begins, it's hard to understand where you're going. Um, for example, gay weddings. Um, gay weddings started back in the 80s. People were getting married. They weren't legal, but they were spiritual marriages, marriages that two people came together and committed to each other. Then, six, seven years ago, when it was gay marriage was legal throughout the United States, 
company started marketing specifically to gay couples. Um, gay couples tend to have more money because they generally have less children. And especially gay men make more money because men make more money than women. So two gay guys are going to make a lot more money than a man and a woman or a woman and a woman. Recently, literally this month, we saw Nielsen, the TV ratings company, start to track gay families as part of their demographics to see what they're watching on TV. Because again, you see these gay families tend to have a lot of money and what are they spending it on? And the marketers want to make sure that they're in on the cash of palooza. Then there are the psychological influences in marketing. And there are about at least five variables and you know you can come up with others. So we have to be motivated. You know, you're laying in bed one night, you're watching TV, you see a commercial for uh, a new coffee pot. You don't like your old coffee pot, so you want to get a new coffee pot. So now you have, you're motivated. You have your phone, you open up Amazon, you order your coffee pot, life is good. But what if you don't like buying on the internet? Your perception of things. So you decide you're going to go to Target and Walmart because you think they have the best prices. So again, that's the kind of thing of how we perceive the world. Then the learning aspect. And this is the knowledge that we gain through experience and study. So you go to Walmart and you find out that the coffee pot's going to cost you $40. You go to Target, you find out the coffee pot's going to buy you, it's going to cost you $44. And you think, well, I already been to Walmart and it's $4 less, but then I'd have to get back in my car and schlep over there and buy it. So you might as well just buy it at Target. It's what we've learned. Blending into that, the attitudes. You know, you know it's only a $4 difference. Who cares? So, you know, that $4, which could buy you a cup of coffee at Starbucks, is going to go towards your coffee maker. And as such, you walk out of Target with your bag and your coffee maker. And the other thing that comes into it is your personality. You know, some people want to do weeks of research till they get exactly the item they want. Other people, it's more about efficiency. I want to get in, I want to get out. You know, just ask people how they Christmas shop. And that will tell you in and of itself their personality traits. Because some people, again, they'll sit on Amazon, they'll get everybody paid for and purchased in, in literally minutes. And <clears throat> other people, they want to go to the mall, they want to go to outlets. They want to shop at different places. They like shopping, so they want to do that more often. Then we have our social influences, and these are the things that impact our purchasing behaviors. For example, your family. Your family sees you buy a brand new phone, and they may be like, what's going on there? You owe us money. So you return the phone and you give them money. Now your family can also positively motivate you in a lot of ways in the sense that, you know, mom and dad drive Toyotas and you have always trusted their driving skills and their cars, so you buy a Toyota. Then there are the reference groups and these are the friends or the people you identify with. <clears throat> these reference groups, so let's say your best friend goes out and gets a new iPhone and you see it and it's awesome and you're like oh my god I have to have one so you're going you're influenced by your friends purchase of this particular phone now the next part is your economic or social status let's say that your friend has money but you're broke and you don't have a job well despite how much you love that cell phone you can't afford it so you have to kind of scale back some of your ideas and then finally, your, your culture, your set of accepted values. So, you know, you find out culture, you know, through a friend that if you go to this uh, seminar on um, finding your inner spirituality, you'll get a coupon for 50% off an iPhone. And you are a devout. Muslim, devout Jew, devout Catholic, and you find this kind of um, conversation really disturbing. So, 
your culture may say to you, no, that's not worth it for me because it's not something I believe in. Now, when we talk about target markets, there's two types. We have the consumer market. This is you and me. We go to the store, we buy a product for our own personal use. Then we have the industrial market. Buyers who want the product for use in making other products. So for example, you are a, produ you are a manufacturer of tires. You need rubber, raw or however it's put together. You're going to buy that rubber from another company so you can make your tires. You also need to buy lug nuts. You also need to buy screws. You might also need to buy hubcaps. All of those things are purchased on an industrial market which will allow you to make your product and then sell it to consumers. You might focus on only one market or both. A farmer, for example, might sell attractive looking peaches to individuals on the consumer market. And on the industrial market, the farmer could sell the ugly peaches to bakeries that will use them to make pies. And this is the standard practice for most large farms, is that they have the, the items that are attractive to a, appeal to the consumer, and then the ones that are, you know, misshapen or lumpy looking, and then can be used in a pie. Now this is a uh, cartoon down here called Dilbert, one of the great cartoons about office life. And it is, uh, our hero Dilbert is saying, our target market is people who don't shop carefully. Our product is designed to attack the user and force them to reorder. We have only sold one customer, we have only sold to one customer, but he's had he's bought 10,000 units. So it's just the absurdity of it all. Um, you know, we as a society want to find a product that we can use over and over again because it reduces our risk. And for those of us who are risk averse, we know that when we buy a particular shampoo, our hair is going to come out the way we like it. If we are stuck using a shampoo that we're not comfortable with, it might send us into, you know, a, fear that we're going to look ridiculous the next time we wash our hair. So the next step is segmenting the market. So we have to divide the entire market into smaller portions or segments. And these are groups of potential customers with common characteristics that influence their buying decisions. And market segments can include, and this is the big one, demographics. This divides the market into groups based on such variables as age, marital status, gender, ethnic background, income, occupation, and education. So they're going to be marketing different products to different groups. So if you watch uh, a rerun of Murder, She Wrote, which was a big show back in the 80s and 90s about this elderly woman who solves crime everywhere she goes, uh, the demographic for that is women who are older and have, you know, a, a certain level of education because they like the mystery aspect. If you are going to watch a Tyler Perry show or movie, their demographic is going to be much different than old white ladies. In, in fact, it would be the exact opposite in many ways. <laughs> Then we have our geographic segmentation, which divides a market according to such variables as climate, region, and population density. And we use the terms urban, meaning very dense, suburban, small town, or rural, and rural is like farmland. For example, people who live in Hawaii will never buy salt for their ice storms because they don't get ice storms. Um, and, and again, you know, throughout the country, there are going to be various products that are more popular in certain places. So, for example, mountain climbing equipment is much more prevalent in a state like Colorado than in a state like Delaware. Then we have behavioral segmentation. And this divides consumers by variables as, such as attitude toward the product, user status, and usage rate. So over here on the right, we have a segmentation of travelers. 
So we have the first guy at the top left, the business traveler, leaves on Monday morning, comes back during the week, carries one small suitcase that he managed to get everything in, and he's ready to go. The leisure traveler, she's got three suitcases, a carry-on, and a puppy. Uh, the leisure traveler, this is the person who's traveling for business, but they're also going to go to Disney World when they go down to Orlando. The millennial traveler, someone who's born um, between 1976 and 1995 ish, give or take. Um, and they're going to be a little bit different. You know how they've said that the millennials have killed things like paper, plastic straws and all that. Well, there's just going to be slight differences. And it's also the same thing you see with baby boomers, same thing you see with Generation X and Generation Y, and now coming up Generation Z or the iGen. Then you have the group travelers. They travel as a group. Maybe it's a couple families together and they are looking for opportunities where their kids will be occupied and not try to kill each other, which apparently is a very um, pre prevalent theme in most families. Then down below the left, you see the Chinese traveler. And again, an American traveler is going to be much different than a Chinese traveler. Same thing with the next one. The female traveler is going to be much different than a male traveler. The female traveler generally is holding not only her own stuff, but she's holding stuff for her kids and or husband. She brings her own carry-on, but she also has a purse. She has different needs. You know, when she goes to the bathroom, it's going to be a little bit different for her in a traveling situation than a man. And then you have the adventure traveler, and this is the guy who has a backpack, and that's it. And he's going to travel around the world wearing, you know, the same pants and the same shirt, and he's his own thing. And then finally you have the wellness traveler. You know, this is the person who's going to go on a 180-mile uh, trek across the London um, or the uh, English York um, Yorkshire mountains and area fields because they really love running and walking and all that kind of fun stuff and not stuff that I would do but then we have the psychographic segmentation which divides consumers on the basis of individual lifestyles as they're reflected in people's interests activities attitudes and values for example some consumers are engaged in winter sports versus other consumers who prefer to couch surf so we have to the behavioral and the psychographic really overlap if you think of a Venn diagram because so much of our psychographic aspects inform our behavioral aspects and vice versa then we have segment clusters which are the target markets we've combined or clustered into a segmented criteria and the easiest way to explain this is to give you the example so let's look at a cooking show that's on TV right now that features both Martha Stewart the the queen of domesticity and rapper Snoop Dogg the king of 80s 90s rap and R&B and recently gospel so there you go and the show is called potluck hmm I wonder what that references huh initially it seems like a very weird partnership but think about the markets that are targeted by each of these individuals. Martha Stewart, sh people who are foodies, do-it-yourselfers, Gen Xers lover, those are the folks who are between the ages of 35 and 54 because we grew up with her. She was on the TV for the past 20 years showing us how to make things a good thing. Home decoration lovers, crafters, and women. Snoop Dogg, on the other hand, appeals to people who like rap and R&B music. He's also a well-known advocate for marijuana, or pot, and you want to think about the show being called Potluck. Generationally, he appeals to Gen Xers, because again, we grew up with him. But he's also popular with the Millennials, and young guys in particular. And a lot of that is his whole cool vibe thing that he has going on. So here's an interesting thing that marketers discovered many do-it-yourselfers love R&B music and rap music so while they're you know building their new wall in their kitchen they're listening to some rap music so combine that with the fact that Martha appeals to women 
and Snoop appeals to young men, they could potentially double their audience when they work together. So the idea here is that although it may not seem like an obvious partnership, when you put them together, there is an integration that will bring twice as many people to the table. Now, interestingly, and this is something that people often comment on, and I just want to point this out, out of Martha and Snoop, the only one of them has a felony record, and it's not, it's not Snoop Dogg. So there you go. You can make your own thoughts on that one. So the marketing world has uh, lots of little tricks and tips. The biggest one is the four P's of marketing. Number one, develop a product that meets the needs of the target market. Number two, setting the price for the product. Number three, distributing the product, getting it to a place where customers can buy it. And then finally, number four, promoting the product informing potential buyers about it. The key to a marketing strategy is to find the correct balance of the four P's. And we're going to go into each of these P's in a little bit more detail. Like I said, there are, you can major in marketing and there are multiple classes you can take that will really take a deep dive. This is very cursory. It's a surface explanation. So first you have to do your research. I know research is boring, but it is absolutely necessary. When marketers begin to develop a product, they research to determine the answers to certain questions which involve the process of collecting and analyzing the data that are relevant to a specific marketing situation. Companies also use it when they're deciding whether or not to refine an existing product or develop a new marketing strategy for an existing product. So, you know, maybe Mountain Dew says, hey, you know what, if we do Mountain Dew, that's the color blue, we're going to get all those people who think uh, blue has a flavor and it'll, we'll add some extra caffeine. Let's see what people think. So you're doing the research and it has two kinds of data. Secondary data, which is information that's already been collected. Some companies, that's all they do is market research and they, they sell it to other companies. And other places, like the government, collects demographic research data. So when, when you fill out the census every 10 years, you're, you know, you're a woman of a certain age, you live in this kind of environment, and... Um, on the last census, they asked whether you were gay or lesbian. Um, they're going to, Donald Trump has decided to remove that, so I don't know what the plan is for that. But, you know, the secondary data can either be purchased or found through governmental or free resources. The other kind is your primary data. And this is newly collected information that addresses the specific questions you are trying to answer. So the secondary or external data can come from a number of sources. The U.S. Census Bureau, for example, like I said, posts demographic information on American households and specifically age, income, education, number of members, both for the country as a whole and specific geographic regions. So you might look at an area in uh, Washington and in Seattle, it tends to skew pretty young whereas somewhere closer to the shore you're going to skew much older because people retire and go towards the water um, so that they have something to look at every day that we all wish we could look at. And then there's the primary or internally available data which comes from your own company and includes sales reports and other information on customers from the company database. So here are some of the questions that they ask. Who are our potential customers? So you have to have that product before you figure out, you know, who are the potential customers? What are they like? What do customers get excited about in terms of a product? What don't they like? What could they change? Um, how much are customers willing to pay for the product? Where will they most likely go to buy the product? How should it be promoted? How can we distinguish it from competing products? There's a product for your hair called Honey Bear Hair, and it are, they are vitamins. 
that are gummy bear vitamins. People love gummy bears, and it's a vitamin, and it's for grown-ups who want to have thicker hair. So you're, you're combining all of these aspects that will make a customer like it and pay for it. How should it be promoted? We distinguish it from competing products. Will enough people buy the product to return a reasonable profit? And should we go ahead and launch the project or the product? All of these things come into play because you don't want to spend the time, the money, the resources on developing a product that no actually wants. So to answer these questions, marketing professionals often contact potential customers who have been randomly selected from their target market. They use a variety of tools for collecting information from these people, each of which has its advantages and disadvantages. So surveys, and a lot of us get surveys because we bought a product from a company or we signed up to take surveys to get points or we were on a trip and um, Expedia or Travelocity wants to know how we, how they did in terms of helping us book our trip. So these surveys get sent out to members of the target market. And the advantage is you can get really good information from past, previous, and current customers. The disadvantage is that it's very time consuming and the response rate can be low without a specific incentive. So, you know, how many of us have been asked to review an item on Amazon that we purchased and we just delete the email because we know we're not going to do it? Or we save it because we think we're going to do it, but we never actually get around to doing it. Then we have personal interviews. And this is when marketers speak directly to potential customers. So uh, they used to do this at the mall all the time. I don't know if they still do, but they would find somebody who was you know, fit the demographic profile and then they would ask them questions and have them, you know, answer open-ended um, to try and understand what the customer is looking for. It's a great advantage, but it can be an expensive option. Then we have focus groups and they use these a lot. This is a very popular method, especially for TV and movies. Marketers bring together a group of individuals, somewhere between 6 to 10 usually, and ask them questions. A trained moderator can explain the purpose of the group and leads the discussion. So, for example, what they'll do is they'll take you into a room and they'll show you the new movie coming out with Chris Pratt or Tom Cruise or some other person. And then they will have you meet with them after the movie to talk about what you liked about the movie, what you didn't like about the movie, and you know they will sometimes make changes to the movie, but it helps them shape how they're going to promote it. If, for example, Tom Cruise is not as popular as he used to be because some of his, uh, some of his statements that he's made, um, they're going to de-emphasize him in the movie. Whereas somebody who is very popular you know, somebody like Ryan Reynolds, for example, who as Deadpool has kind of revitalized that concept, you know, they're going to feature him right up front. So these focus groups come away with a lot of valuable information for both the product and the strategy. Now, another thing that happens is a branding. And you may have heard this in terms of personal branding, like who you are as a person. But in this context, we're looking at product or service branding. And it is a word, letter, sound, or symbol that would differentiate a product from similar products on the market. To protect a brand name, the company takes out a trademark by registering it with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And the idea here is to build brand equity, which means added value generated by favorable customer experiences. So for example, you can go into a McDonald's in the middle of nowhere, Montana, and still get that Big Mac that you can get in Philadelphia. It's the same exact thing because the brand of McDonald's has been very, very consistent. Brand loyalty, the tendency of some consumers to continue buying the same brand of goods rather than a competing brand. So, you know, my favorite example is Heinz Ketchup. I don't care about Hunt's or any other gourmet ketchup. It's got to be Heinz. 
Um, some people, it's got to be Coca-Cola. They don't like Pepsi. They don't like the taste of Pepsi. Other people don't like the taste of Coca-Cola, and they think Pepsi is the greatest thing that was ever made. So we all have our brand loyalties, but it's usually a limited number of things we have a brand loyalty to. Um, for example, I've used Crest toothpaste since I was a little kid, and I've tried using Colgate and other things, but I always come back to my Crest. So let's talk about branding strategies. With private branding or private labeling, a company makes a product and sells it to a retailer who in turn resells it under its own name. So a soft drink maker, for example, might make a cola for Acme to sell as Acme's Cola house brand. Um, and again, it could be Coca-Cola making this stuff and selling anything that doesn't meet their quality standards as a generic version kind of thing to Acme to sell as an Acme soda. And we see this a lot with, you know, the, especially the different flavors like the orange soda, the grape sodas. There's all kinds of cheap uh, versions of that um, because people who like orange soda or grape soda are going to buy it. They don't care about the brand as much as they care about the, the product itself. Then we have generic branding. The maker attaches no branding information to a product except a description of its contents. Customers are often given a choice between a brand name prescription drug or a cheaper generic drug with a similar chemical makeup. So once a drug is no longer under patent, then other pharmaceutical companies can make generic versions. So for example, acetaminophen which is initially was Tylenol but now there's all kinds of generic versions of that same thing with acetaminophen with um, Advil you know and and the different ibuprofens that are available um, that are similar to Advil but are cheaper and if you don't care about the brand name you know the generic is almost always the same number three Manufacture branding. A company sells one or more products under its own brand name. Adopting a multi-product branding approach, it sells the products under one brand name, generally the company name. Using a multi-branding approach, it will assign different brand names to different products. So Campbell Soup Company uses multi-product branding. Each of their soup products includes the name of the company, Campbell Chicken Noodle Soup, Campbell Tomato Soup. Automakers generally use multi-branding. So Toyota, for example, markets to a wide range of potential customers by offering cars under various brand names. So you have your Toyota, but Lexus and Scion also. So if you're not somebody who's really, you know, deep into the world of cars, you may not even realize that the Lexus you're driving is actually a Toyota product. Then we have packaging which is the wrapping material around a consumer item that serves to contain, identify, describe, protect, display, promote, and otherwise make the product marketable and keep it clean. Think of kids' toys and how impossible it is to open those plastic containers. Well, they do that on purpose because they know that a seven-year-old left alone for 30 seconds can pretty much open anything, but making it difficult then kind of makes it easier to keep that product intact. The packaging can influence a customer's decision to buy a product or pass it up by giving customers a glimpse of the product and it should be designed to attract their attention. Now this is also where we get into those social and cultural changes. Way back in the 80s McDonald's exclusively used styrofoam packaging. Well, in the 90s, we found out that styrofoam is really bad for us and we shouldn't be using it. It's bad for the planet, meaning. So they then went to cardboard. And nowadays, when you go buy your Big Mac, you get a cardboard box instead of a styrofoam box. Labeling includes certain information that a company may be required to include on the label of your product when it is distributed, just as who made it and where or what risks are associated with it such as being unsuitable for small children. You know, you go to McDonald's, you get a Happy Meal, and they give you a toy, and it says right there on the toy, not suitable for children under three, and you hand it to your two-year-old, 
oblivious because we're so used to looking at labels and ignoring them. Labels of food products sold in retail outlets must contain information about the ingredients and nutritional value. Moving on to our next P, so we did product, now we're at pricing. Pricing a new product is a very tricky proposition. Price it too high, consumers won't give it a try. Price it too low, and consumers may think it's a cheapo piece of poo. Additionally, the pricing decisions that you have to make will differ significantly if you're selling goods for resale by retailers or directly to the consumer. For example, you own a shoe store and it costs you $40 to buy a pair of Nikes from the factory. You then turn around and charge your customers $80 for the shoes so you can make your $40 profit. Some of the product pricing strategies include what we call skim market, skim pricing, which is when you introduce a new product idea to the marketplace, you start off with the highest possible price that an interested customer would pay. This approach generally leads to early profits, but when competition enters, and it will, you will have to lower your price. So, for example, the first Tesla vehicle, vehicles were pretty expensive. However, as interest grew and competition from the other car companies increased, Tesla created a competitively priced vehicle to compete with hybrid and other electric vehicles. So, you know, when you have something that nobody else sells but is very, very appealing to people, it leads them to this concept of let's make our money and then we'll deal with being competitive later. We have penetration pricing, and this is when the company charges a low price for the new product, both to discourage competition and to grab a sizable share of the market. This strategy might give the company some competitive breathing room. Potentially, uh, competitors won't be attracted to low prices and modest profits. Over time, as the company claims more and more market share, they can push up its prices. For example, Comcast and Xfinity regularly offer low introductory prices such as free premium channels for $99. At the end of a specified period, the price increases. Most consumers continue paying this higher bill with only a few going to a new provider providing an introductory rate. One of the most uh, famous examples of penetration pricing is what Netflix did. Netflix, for $7.99 a month, you could watch anything on their streaming service. And for 8 bucks a month, that is an amazing deal. Well, once they got to a certain customer base, the price popped up to 11 or $12, which again, for as much as people watch Netflix, is a tremendous, you know, um, it's a tremendous product for the price we're paying. That extra four dollars is a third more than what we were paying before. And, you know, again, it's that price that we're willing to pay for a particular product. You know, they might be able to push Netflix up to twenty dollars a person before they start losing customers. But eventually they will and that'll help them identify what the best penetration price you know what the price should be after their pre penetration pricing. Moving on to cost-based pricing, the company's managerial accountants figure out how much it costs to make a product and then they set a price by adding a profit to the cost. Walmart uses this type of pricing in order to keep their prices as low as possible. So let's say they buy 10,000 t-shirts with Spongebob on them from a factory in China. And those 10,000 shirts will cost them after you pay for the product, you pay to have it transported, you pay to have the Walmart tag uh, clipped on there, might be $4. And then they're going to sell the t-shirt for $6 because they want to make $2 on every product that they sell. And this is hypothetical, I don't know what their actual pricing strategy is. But, you know, Getting a $6 Spongebob shirt is going to be a pretty good bonus for most people. 
Then we have demand-based pricing, which is a pricing method based on the customer's demand and the perceived value of the product. One example is that of Walt Disney World in Florida, which now increases their ticket prices during holidays and certain weekends, in contrast to times when there is less demand. So um, having been in Disney World on Christmas Eve, um, first of all, Magic Kingdom, you can't move. Epcot is a huge park, but it's still crowded, so they jump the prices, keep out the people who are on the fence, and won't spend $140 for a day at the park. But for people who are really, you know, Disney fanatics, and they want to be in Disney World on Christmas or New Year's, which are the two busiest days, people are going to spend that money. Um... Again, the idea here is they figured out what people are willing to pay to be in Disney World on Christmas or New Year's Eve. Then you have target pricing, which is you figure out, again, using research findings, how much consumers are willing to pay for a product to set the price. Then you deduct the amount of the profit the company wants to make on the product, and that tells you what your budget for the production is. So if you know that a customer is willing to pay $500 for a cell phone and you know you want to make at least $200 off that cell phone, then you know that you have $300 to work with to create, manufacture, and produce that cell phone. Prestige pricing, when a company sets prices artificially high to foster the impression that they're offering a high quality product. So going back to the example I used about Toyota. Toyota has a um, company car, one of the cars they sell under a different name is Lexus. Well, Lexus is going to be at least ten or $20,000 higher than any of the Toyotas that you can buy because it's seen as a prestige brand and they want to give you the impression that you're getting more. And yeah, it's pretty on the inside, it has all kinds of bells and whistles, but it's not $20,000 worth of bells and whistles. But when people see that you are driving a Lexus, they think that you have some cash sitting in your pocket. It's a prestige, it's the illusion that you have money. Then there's the odd and even pricing, and this is when companies set prices at figures such as $9.99, which is an odd amount, counting on the common impression that it sounds cheaper than $10 and even amount. And again, you know, we all know it's a penny and a penny is not even worth the amount of money it costs to make a penny, but we have this little thing in our brain that we're going to save money, even though we know it's a penny. So we talked about pricing, we talked about the product, and now we're going to talk about placing that product. Placing a product refers to the strategies for distribution. Distribution entails all activities involved in getting the right quantity of your product to your customers at the right time and at a reasonable cost. This involves selecting the most appropriate distribution channels and handling the physical distribution of products. The first question a company must ask is if they are going to sell directly to the consumer or if they'll be using an intermediary such as a retailer or a wholesaler. So you'll see over here on the right the graphic shows a producer who sells directly to the consumer. There's no middlemen or middle women. Producers who sell to retailers and then who sell to consumers are going to have higher costs and the same thing with using a wholesaler. The consumer eventually has to absorb that cost. Why doesn't everybody just sell directly to consumers? Well, it's a lot more complicated than that. Now, in addition to products, we're also looking at service industries. And most service companies have to sell directly to their customers. You can't give a haircut or fix a car or fit a contact lens, mow a lawn, through a retailer or a wholesaler. There's also the fact that many business to business or B2B sales take place through direct contact between the producer and the buyer. Toyota, for instance, buys direct, 
tires directly from a tire supplier. So when one business buys supplies from another business so they can make a product, that's called B2B. Then we have the internet as a distribution channel in and of itself. So the internet has greatly expanded the number of companies who use direct distribution either as their only distribution channel or as an additional means of selling. For example, many artists are now using Etsy as their primary means of selling items. So people who make earrings, people who draw, who uh, knit, who crochet, who do anything that's crafty or artsy, you can go on Etsy, they got a step-by-step -step on how to sell, and you can start selling all the stuff that you have made. Selling directly to the consumer allows for much more control over your prices and selling activities. However, you have to do all the work, including the selling and the making and the shipping. And this is not always feasible. So a lot of times people get overwhelmed, especially if a product that they're selling is very popular. So every contact between a producer and a consumer incurs costs. The more contacts in the process, the higher the overall cost to consumers. The presence of an intermediary substantially reduces the total number of contacts. So a lot of times what you'll see is, and we're going to use Amazon because Amazon has a lot of small companies who sell through them. They're the supplier. So you supply products um, to an Amazon seller. You have to buy supplies from a manufacturer. You then create the product and you sell it to somebody who sells on Amazon. And then they ship it to the consumer. So, you know, the more intermediaries, the more people who touch the product, which means the more you have um, to deal with. But if you get a big intermediary, a wholesaler, for example, um, it could actually reduce the cost. So again, you know, if you don't have a large company, but you do have a large number of customers, then using an intermediary like a wholesaler is going to be much more um, beneficial. So retailers buy goods from producers or wholesalers and sell them to consumers, whether in stores, by phone, through direct mail, or over the internet. Selling through retailers means giving up some control over pricing and promotion. The retailer purchases products from the producer and they mark it up to a retail price. The wholesaler or manufacturer's price is substantially lower than the price charged to consumers. So the item starts off at the supplier's factory in different components, it goes to the manufacturer who puts the components together and builds it and basically makes a product that is then warehoused, transported or distributed to a dealer's outlet where eventually a customer will buy it. So retail is probably the most common way people buy things, but if you're a small business, there are other ways. Now let's look at a really, really big company like CVS, and these people use wholesalers. So they negotiate sales transactions with the maker of every single product that it carries in its stores. And if they had to do that for every product, it would take an enormous amount of time, effort. You walk through a CVS, they've got food, they've got meds, they've got tampons, they've got diapers, they've got baby formula, they have snacks, they have greeting cards, they have wrapping paper, I could go on. But what CVS does is they deal with a wholesaler, and this is, can also be called a distributor. And these are intermediaries who buy goods from the suppliers and sell them to businesses that will either resell or use them. So let's say that CVS prices a box of bandages at $2. They go through a wholesaler, they, be, they buy the box of bandages for $1.50, and then when they make the sale, they make 50 cents on the box of bandages. But they look at it from the larger perspective of not only are they buying bandages, but they're also buying uh, knee braces, they're buying uh, different ointments for burns, 
They're buying lip balm. They're buying all this stuff from maybe one wholesaler. So they're going to package this into one big price, which will then bring the prices down even more. So while selling through wholesalers will cut into the profit margin, the practice has some really, really striking advantages. First, wholesalers make it their business to find the best outlets for the goods in which they specialize. You know, they're, they're generally, you know, especially a wholesaler who deals with a big company like CVS, doesn't want to mess up the deal by providing band-aids that don't adhere to anything. Number two, they're often provided warehouse space for suppliers. And this is hugely important because warehouse space is expensive. I mean, if you're a CVS in the middle of New York City, where, which is one of the highest rents in the country, you can't afford a warehouse on Fifth Avenue. You're going to have a, a warehouse either in northern Jersey or western part of New York that will then truck this stuff in. And the wholesalers will often provide this warehouse space. Household, uh, wholesalers will also transport the goods from the supplier's plant to the point of final sale. So they don't even have to have the trucks. The wholesaler provides the trucks. So again, wholesalers bring a lot to the um, retailer or manufacturer and they just make it easier in the chain of selling items. Other challenges that placement is deals with, materials handling. You have to make, store, and distribute these items. It's tough. Warehousing, because there is that time lag between the manufacturer and delivery, that means that the items need to be stored somewhere and a large warehouse that brings in its own set of costs, as I mentioned. Then there's also automation. Um, if you've never seen the video, and I'll include this in the class um, page, but if you're not in this class but still interested, you can go on YouTube and find it. Amazon uses robotics in addition to human labor to pick and pack items that consumers order. And if you think that Amazon has millions of items, of course it has to be automated. The company has to absorb the cost of automation if the volume of sales is high or the product is not easily carried like a car. So you'll see in car companies, their manufacturing plants are all automated. Again, they have to absorb the cost, but over time, you are making back the money through the profits that you're selling. In the 1980s, manufacturers began to use the just-in-time manufacturing strategy, which requires companies that supply goods to deliver their materials to the facility just in time for them to go into the production process. And this practice cuts the time and cost entailed of housing and moving raw materials in and out of storage. Toyota was one of the first companies to use just-in-time engineering and of course you know they need the tires, they need um, the interior upholstery, they need the engines, they need the metal and all of this stuff would be timed perfectly to arrive before the employees showed up to start making the cars and then they would have various deliveries throughout the day which would reduce their need to warehouse anything. And then finally, transportation. Whether by truck, boat, or train, the cost of transportation becomes a significant part of manufacturing prices. One of the things that you'll see is large products are rarely, if ever, transported via airplane because it's so expensive. You're going to ship a Mercedes from Germany to the United States, it's going to come over on a boat. Um, you know, we always see on trains all those boxcars. There's nobody sitting in these cars. There are, well, maybe a couple hobos. But the, the idea of the train is that it is a cheap, effective way to move large amounts of a product from one spot to another. And then, of course, all of us who have been on the highway and have seen trucks delivering items, and it's just part of their manufacturing process. So moving on to our final P, promotion. And the promotion mix is the means by which you communicate with customers and it includes the advertising, personal selling, sales, promotion, and the publicity. 
These are all tools for telling people about your product and persuading potential customers, whether consumers or other organizational users like B2B, to buy it. So the questions that marketing professionals ask are, what's the main purpose of the promotion? Am I simply trying to make people aware of my product or buy it right now? Am I trying to develop long-term customers? Am I trying to promote my company's image? What's my target market? What's the best way to reach it? Which product features, quality, price, service, availability, innovativeness should I emphasize? How does my product differ from those of other competitors? How much can I afford to invest in a promotional campaign? Um, in the movie business, they, the, the idea is to take 30% of what it costs to make the movie to promote it. So if a movie costs $100 million to make, they're going to spend $30 million promoting it. And how do my competitors promote their products? Should I take a similar approach? So, you know, things like a cell phone, and I, and I keep using cell phone as an example because we all have them and we all rely on them. Um, and some of us, you know, get a new one every year or every two years and others of us are still carrying around the clamshell. But, so think about this new iPhone that just came out, the iPhone X. What did they push on it? the photographic aspect and think about how many selfies are taken on a daily basis we now rely on our phones almost exclusively to take pictures unless we're a professional so you know that's going to be something that's really important to the people who could potentially buy an iPhone then we have advertising which is paid non-personal communication designed to create an awareness of a product or company it's estimated that the average consumer is exposed to about 5,000 ad messages each day compared with about 500 ads a day in the 1970s. For this very reason, ads aren't as effective as they used to be. We've just become numb to them, really. But advertising is still the most prevalent form of promotion. Your choice of advertising media depends on your product, your target audience, and your budget. So, for example, if you're trying to sell adult diapers to geriatric uh, people, people who are really, really old, doing it online is probably not the best option at this point. Um, these two ads, I just love them. Your wife is hot, better get the AC fixed. It's funny. And a lot of advertisers will use emotion significantly to um, reflect or try to gain people's interest because we love humor. Humans love humor. It's our nature. Um, FedEx, we'd love to handle your package. That sounds dirty, but it's not if you think of a package that FedEx sells, but it makes the inner 12-year-old in us giggle a little because it's funny. Other promotional activities include personal selling, which refers to that one-on-one -on -one communication with customers or potential customers. This type of interaction is necessary in selling large ticket items such as homes and cars. You're not going to buy a house without looking at it. You know, you, we all go drive a car to make sure that, you know, the car still runs. Well, if it's a brand new car or if it's, you know, used, we would hope that would happen. Sales promotion is when a company provides an incentive for a potential customer to buy something. For example, if you get a specific bank's credit card, you may qualify for a 5% rebate on all purchases. So if you spend $10,000 a year, that's $500, so that's not a bad deal. Um, publicity is getting your company or your product mentioned or featured in a newspaper or on TV. And people who do this are often called public relations specialist, which involves shaping consumers' perceptions of a company, and it is often very important to a company's success. So when a company does something worth mentioning, such as sponsoring a fundraising event, the public relations department will issue a press release to promote the event. Now, for example, McDonald's for years have sponsored the Ronald McDonald Houses, which are usually located near a children's hospital, and it's for the entire family to live there while the child is receiving treatment. 
and you know you drive up to a McDonald's to get your Big Mac and there's always a little container that you can donate to this fundraising effort and for anybody who's ever had a sick kid it becomes real when you're sitting in that hospital and somebody comes in and says well your son or daughter will have to be here for a week but we have the Ronald McDonald house next door and they have room for you they have a hugely positive um, impact on families who are going through terrible terrible events as a consequence McDonald's who you know admittedly sells food that is not good for us but is also delicious at times especially their fries um, they promote that because that's going to make them look really good now on the other side when the company does something negative such as when Turing pharmaceuticals increase the price of a prescri prescription drug for children with toxoplasmosis from 1350 to 750 a tablet the public relations department went to con work to control the damage to the company and the first thing they did was recommend getting rid of their CEO Martin Screlly who had just been indicted for fraud anyway so you know public relations they prefer to do the positive stuff but the most necessary when bad stuff happens and again if you uh, remember when we talked about the BP disaster with management you know the fact that Tony Hayward did such a lousy job managing um, the oil spill that he was gone within the year then we have what's known as customer relationship management or CRM and this is a very important aspect these days because when with all things being equal it's how you treat your customers that'll help you keep your customers customer relation management is a marketing strategy that focuses on using information about current customers to nurture and maintain strong relationships with them the underlying theory is fairly basic to keep customers happy you treat them well give them what they want listen to them reward them with discounts and other loyalty incentives and deal effectively with their complaints for example all of the casinos have customer loyalty cards that will provide special options such as free rooms so you go down to Atlantic City and you go to the Borgata and you have the Borgata loyalty card and you play the slots and you play eh, maybe five hundred dollars you lose with the slots well you're gonna get a free dinner because now they know you've just lost five hundred dollars and they want to make sure you're not truly miserable so now you qualify for a free meal which will take a little of the pain away and again with people who are gamblers five hundred dollars may be nothing to them you know ten thousand dollars might be when they get the free room but casinos do the research they know what pain points exist for their customers another advantage of keeping in touch with customers is the opportunity to offer them additional products think about the last time you bought something off of Amazon now you receive offers in your email for items that are similar to the ones you already bought or could be used with it let's say that you were doing some pre shopping for an engagement ring or a piece of jewelry on Amazon and but you decide not to buy but every time you do a search or you go on Facebook all of a sudden now there's all these ads from Amazon about rings or jewelry because that's how embedded Amazon has um, created their marketing so that you know even if you decide that day not to buy it they're still gonna remind you on a basis even if you don't look at your email other marketing issues so we have mass marketing which is the practice of sending out messages to a vast audience of anonymous people you know those Viagra ads that we get in our our emails all the time you know um, they don't know that I don't need Viagra I'm a girl so they should figure it out but they don't and they send it figuring that I may have a husband who needs it when a company asks customers if they can contact them they are engaged in what we call permission marketing TV and radio advertising is a form of interruption marketing that interrupts people to get their attention with the hope they will listen to the ad so for example interruption 
you're watching TV, the ad comes on, you get up, you go to the bathroom, you get a snack, you come back, you're going to see some of the ad. Whereas inbound is, you know, you've signed up for a customer loyalty card at ShopRite. Now you're going to get a weekly advertisement that is emailed to you or mailed to you because you gave them permission to do it. Now, in, of course, in the last 10 years, there, there's been a rise in social media marketing. And keeping in mind that social media really didn't exist in the 20th century. It is an exclusively 21st century idea. Social media marketing is the practice of including social media as a part of the company's marketing program. Advantages of social media marketing include the following. Create brand awareness engage customers and potential customers in a two-way conversation, build brand loyalty, offer and publicize incentives, gather feedback on products and marketing initiatives, have customers spread the word about products and marketing initiatives, and usually it's a low-cost marketing opportunity because unless you're paying for the ads, just using the social media is not going to cost you anything. But you can also pay for ads to appear and you know and Facebook's been under a lot of pressure in the last couple of years because they were taking money from some shady characters but on the other side of the coin you know how many of us have been you know flipping through on our phone looking at Facebook and we saw a product that was being advertised maybe a t-shirt with something that was really funny on it that we click on and we buy it that's great or you know you go to your you go on Facebook and you say to your friends hey does anybody have a good plumbing company to use or a good realtor and again you know these companies look for that stuff um, if you ever have a problem with a company go on their social media tweet at them or um, Facebook at them and tell them I'm really unhappy with this such and such you'll get contacted because there are people who are monitoring these pages and want to make sure that any customer who complains verbally or vocally on the social media is immediately addressed. A challenge of social media marketing is that it can be very time consuming to stay in touch with your customers and potential customers. So there may be, for example, if you work at a company, a large company like McDonald's, there may be five or six people who just look at Facebook all day because so many people are posting about McDonald's and that's where those hashtags come become very important and finally just to kind of put a period at the end of this very long lecture um, we have our product life cycle once a new product is developed it is introduced to the market with any success it begins to grow event and that attracts more buyers at some point the market stabilizes and the product becomes mature. Eventually, however, its appeal diminishes and it exits the marketplace. So let's use something that was very popular in the 80s and 90s, and those are beepers. Beepers were you type in your phone number and somebody would know to call you back. Because in these days we didn't have cell phones. The beeper concept was very popular um, and everybody had one clipped to their belt and then the 90s hit and by the mid 90s cell phones were not only available but they were extremely affordable and you saw beeper the beepers no longer having much of a um, market so we went from them at being introduced people buying them lots of people buying them and then the sales starting to go down as a new product came on the market that was much more appealing so as a product moves through its life cycle the company has to shift its marketing mix strategies and that's a very important concept if you look at a um, company like McDonald's that is constantly reinventing itself uh, you know, McDonald's started off um, just lunch and dinner, then it invented breakfast, and then it invented the dollar meal, or the dollar menu, and now it's doing breakfast all day, which has been a hugely 
popular revenue source for McDonald's in the last couple of years. So again, you're always looking at how you can improve your product because the there is an inevitability that it will stop being attractive because it'll no longer be relevant. And that's the key. You got to keep your product relevant no matter what. So that's it for this presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to text or email me. If you do not belong, um, if you do not attend our school, but have questions, please leave a comment and I will respond as soon as I can. Thank you and have a fabulous day.